In spring 1942, there were 250 Americans of Japanese ancestry enrolled at six California State University campuses. On February 19, 1942, Executive Order 9066 and the military orders that followed forever changed the course of their lives. These young adults, the Nisei, born and raised in California, full of promise and hope, were forced to leave their communities and drop out of college. Some moved to an inland state, but most were rounded up and sent to live in an American-style concentration camp in the most desolate parts of the country. Manzanar, Tule Lake, Topaz, Hart Mountain, Rower, Gila River, Poston, Amachi, Jerome, Minidoka, became their new home for the duration of World War II. After their release, many Nisei never had the chance to return to college. Their dreams of a college education shattered. In the spring of 2010, the CSU located 125 of these former students and presented them with special honorary bachelor's degrees at commencement ceremonies at six campuses. These degrees, although long overdue, brought tears, smiles, and a sense of closure for the former CSU students and the community. The barbed wire fences that imprisoned them and tore them away from their aspirations have now been replaced by the dignity of their very special honorary bachelor's degrees. Conferral of these honorary degrees is a wonderful idea it is well-deserved and symbolically very important. As someone who experienced internment myself, this cer ceremony has a lot of personal meaning for me as well as you, the honorees. However, I was only six years old at the time, and went through first through third grades in the Minidoka, Idaho internment camp. If I had been old enough to be in college like all of you honorees, I can only imagine how you must have felt to be forced to terminate your higher education under these traumatic and demoralizing circumstances. Your average age at the time of internment was about 19, and almost all of you were American-born citizens. I'm sure your education in American schools imbued you with a deep belief in such American ideals as democracy, freedom, and liberty, making you among the most loyal and patriotic citizens of this nation. In the spring of 1942, some 43 San Diego State students had to leave school because of Federal Executive Order 9066. With the stroke of a pen, families were devastated. Their life's work forcibly abandoned, property left behind, college careers disrupted, loyalty doubted, constitutional rights ignored. Please bear with me the next few minutes if I get a little emotional, because today we're honoring some incredible, inspiring individuals. They deserve our utmost respect and admiration. I can think of no better way to participate in this commencement season than to be here today, honoring former San Jose State University students, as well as several other students who attended CSU campuses. These individuals succeeded despite having their lives uprooted and their dreams disrupted as a result of dramatic events that affected them through no fault of their own. Though long overdue, these honorary degrees represent a writing of a past wrong. Listen now to the stories of 11 CSU honorees and or their families as they speak about their lives. We uh, were farmers and we uh, first uh, raised chili pepper. Didn't do too well in that, so we uh, switched to tomatoes and uh, celery and th things like that. 
No, my parents didn't have much of an education, but uh, education to the, my, uh, my parents were very important. I think the Niseis were very fortunate that their parents forced them to go to uh, uh, graduate from high school and go to college. My dad, John Hiroshi Otomo, was my best buddy and friend, especially in the last six months of his life. He wanted to be a mechanic, but because of the ranch, he majored in agronomy instead. John Otomo was somebody who liked to get involved. He didn't want to sit back and watch. And he was part of an original group that formed the Ag Honorary. Um, it's still in function at Fresno State. He's very proud of that factor as being a charter member. I graduated Point Loma High School in 1941. And I believe in September of that year was my first year at school. So I was still kind of uh, floundering as far as what my real goals was. I said, well, I'll go to San Diego State University and I'll, you know, start to get my education and then I'll, I'll find my way while I'm there. He was majoring in the sciences. I believe he intended to do what he did all along, and that was sort of follow in the older two brothers' footsteps, majoring in the sciences and going to pharmacy school. I believe he did expected me to go to college. They never had mentioned it, you know, but I came to San Francisco to go to college because there was nowhere I could stay in Honolulu to go to the university because I was living, living on, in the Big Island. And so my aunt asked my dad to come to San Francisco and stay with her. And I, that's why I came to San Francisco and went to college. I was born in San Francisco and my dad, grandfather, he bought a section of ground here and told my dad to farm. From there he expanded. He expanded from 20 acres to 120 in a few years. Unfortunately, my mother passed away in uh, the late October and didn't know anything about this program and unfortunately uh, received this degree posthumously. My mother uh, attended CSU. She attended uh, San Jose State. Uh, she grew up in Sunnyvale, California, which San Jose State, I think, was the closest geographically to where she grew up. My grandfather was a dentist. So uh, actually, that's why she went to San Diego State University, because uh, she was, her intent was to become a dental hygienist to help her father. My mother was a music major, and she, she went to, to, to San Francisco with three good friends that she graduated uh, Hanford High School with. My mom played uh, the piano and the organ at the Buddhist church in Fowler uh, for a long, long time. She was there for approximately two and a half, three years before uh, she uh, was forced to go to camp. And I think one of the regrets she, she had in life was not being able to, uh, to get her degree. I think typically in many of the Japanese American families, education was, was very much emphasized as an important thing to pursue. And so I don't think there was any doubt at all that they would go on to college. My Aunt Velma knew that she wanted to major in science and biology. And my Aunt Helen um, went to Fresno State, and I think her major was in business administration. She eventually went on to have a career as an adjudicator for the Veterans Administration in Los Angeles. I didn't even know that they attended Fresno State um, at the time, so I was really surprised to find out later, but I have seen pictures of them in groups of uh, Japanese Americans. And I heard Cal Poly was an up-and-coming college, and it had a, a, a very high course and good course in ornamental horticulture and plant propagation. Uh, going to college, it was like another dream. I never dreamt anything like this existed. Education was probably the number one priority in the family, um, uh, but always for the kids, so it was always my generation. Um, school was not an option. School was something that was, like we told a lot of people, not are you going to college, it was which college are you going to. A friend of mine said, yeah, Yosh, what are you going to do? I said, oh, I don't know. He said, well, why don't we go to school? I said, where? Uh, 
San Jose State. And I said, San Jose State? No, I never heard of it. All three of these former students were admitted in September of 1940. They were forced to leave in 1942. And had they not been interned, they would have graduated uh, in the class of 1944. My father's born in California, my grandfather's born in Hawaii, and on my mother's side they're from the Sacramento Elk Grove area, and they met in camp during World War II. Uh, it was one of those good news, bad news. The bad news was that they were in camp. The good news was that had they not met, I wouldn't be here, so those are the kinds of ways of history. And one of the touchstones in our community is the camps the Japanese were incarcerated in during World War II. It's always a reference point. Uh, eventually, during the conversation with new friends or strangers, even if they're Japanese American, somewhere along the way, the question comes up, were you in camp? If you were in camp, what camp? If you weren't in camp, what camp was your family in? And that becomes just a touchstone for our community. And in the beginning, very few in our community talked about it after the war. It was as described by a second generation Nisei activist named Edison Nuno, he described it as like being a rape victim, where you don't want to talk about it, uh, but it has a tremendous impact on your life. I think that, that, that one Japanese word, gaman, pretty much depicts that entire generation. It pretty much says that they will endure the worst of the worst with patience and dignity. And that pretty much sums that word gaman. So I think what it did is they realized that they just had to move forward silently and not dwell in the past, just move forward. The interesting thing for me was the experience of those that were going to the college, the university, uh, the state colleges that existed and community colleges at the time. Their, their sense of their future was uh, the proverbial rug was pulled out from underneath them. So it was about finishing up tying together loose ends, uh, putting closure to, and that was the motivation for doing uh, AB 37. On uh, Pearl Harbor, that morning of Pearl Harbor, we had an assignment uh, with the landscaping uh, uh, corps to go clean the garden. And this was this is the attorney's office. Sunday morning, we went there with four people, clean his yard. And we came back to the cafeteria, and all of a sudden the cafeteria was just quiet as we walked in. So I asked my dorm mate, I said, what the hell's going on? Did you hear about it? He says, what? He tells me, Pearl Harbor. And then I knew all of a sudden that food we had didn't taste that good. But then the war broke out, and that just 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 took the rug out of, of, of my foundation of what I thought. I, I knew that he was really disappointed that the war came and that it meant internment camp and having to leave the university. That was a real disappointment. That I, I can remember thinking about that often as a undergraduate in college, thinking, my gosh, if, I, if this had happened to me, how would I feel? I was in college at the time uh, the World War II started. Uh, it just happened that uh, I was on a holiday break. A few of my friends and I had gone over to hunt for, do a little hunting in, in uh, Lancaster. And on the way back, uh, we heard through the radio that, that Pearl Harbor had happened. And, and Coming back, I guess the first thing we did <clears throat> was hide all of our guns because we were scared that it was, you know, if we ever got caught with it, we may be uh, taken down as a, as a, well, helpful to Japan. There was a freeze on our traveling, so we could not travel more, uh, more than what, what, two, one or two miles. From, from the, wherever you live. I was drafted in February. I had I quit. I came back to school 
And then I got my draft notice, so I went. Next morning, my dad called me up. It was about 10 o'clock, and he says, can you get some cash for me? I said, what cash? I had about $3,000 in my account. That was my college education fund. At that time, that was big money. And he said, can you draw it out and uh, bring it home? I said, why? He said, my account is frozen. The bank won't let me write no check on it. And he says, looks like you're gonna have to quit school. I said, why? He says, I got nobody to help me on the farm. I can't take care of myself. The U.S. government decided you could not be trusted and rounded you up along with about 120,000 other Japanese Americans, two-thirds of whom were American-born citizens, <clears throat> and incarcerated you without trials or even hearings, sometimes with only 48 hours notice. You could only take what you could carry and were held initially in temporary holding facilities, the so-called assembly centers, such as the Santa Anita Racetrack in Los Angeles County and the Tamferan Racetrack in Northern California. They all went into camp at Jerome, Arkansas. I felt that they don't belong there, but what can you do, what can I do when the, when the government the U.S. government says they have to go to this relocation camps, the different relocation camps. I'm an American citizen, but I couldn't fight the army or the, <laughs> the government, you know. Went to Granada, which was a station there, and then Amachi was our camp. They called it Amachi. They, uh, they checked us out, gave us a number. What uh, shack we were supposed to go into and they had a bus waiting for us and we went there and I'll never forget I was carrying my kid sister's bag my mother's bag and myself and the guard says to me you're not supposed to carry three bags I said I'm carrying it and I stopped along he stopped me told me to drop it I said okay I dropped all three bags and walked walked off and I went into the bus and then another soldier came and picked up and brought the bags to the bus. I got a laugh out of that. When I got home, uh, they, they, we had an executive order that we had to evacuate f from, uh, from the coast and that uh, we had to, what they call the first interceptor command and that we were either go to an internment camp or you go out of this fourth interceptor command, which was off the coast. So my, my father had already decided that we didn't want to go to any internment camp. So we decided to leave. We headed uh, east. Uh, Salt Lake City was the closest uh, uh, city we could go to, so uh, that's where we went. In the case of my mother, she was interred at Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, and the only stories I recall from her were being rounded up and spending the first couple of weeks uh, in horse stalls um, uh, with straw uh, at Santa Anita Racetrack before being uh, shipped to Wyoming. Um, incredibly desolate place, I've been there. In the case of my father, he remained in California he was at probably the largest internment camp. He was at Manzanar. After they were, you know, put in the camps, he went into and enlisted because he felt it was the right thing to do to show his allegiance to the United States. And he did talk about his wartime experiences with me during that last six months. He said he remember going to a, being enlisted, and they, there was a row of white folks. There was a row of black folks getting water and he didn't know where to go because he was just out of camp. So he was going to go in the line with the blacks because he, they were just treated pretty poorly and they took and poked him out of the line and made him go into the other line. And so he was conflicted and he felt that was totally the wrong thing to do for all people serving the United States. We're playing catch next to the uh, shacks there and the barbed wire there. The ball went outside the fence, and there's a tower with a guy with a gun. 
And I told the guy, I said, can I go after that ball? He says, you step your foot across that fence, I'll blow your brains out. And about half an hour later, I see him sleeping up there. So I crawled between the fence and got the ball. As I crossed that fence, he saw me. He says, he's going to shoot me. I said, go ahead, shoot. And I was holding the ball. I said, go ahead, shoot. Pretty soon, the jeep with three guys come over there. I said, which one of you guys crossed the fence? And we started pointing fingers. He did. About 20 of us. Everybody pointing fingers at each other. My mom talks fondly of making good friends at Jerome in, in the camps. But one of the downsides, my mother said, even though while she was doing it, she didn't realize this was happening, uh, was that she was in her early 20s then. So she would go off and eat meals and do things with her friends. So when she looked back at that episode, while she made great, long-lasting, lifetime friends, uh, there was no family unity. The family basically didn't do much together. Interesting enough, in Jerome, Arkansas, people who had some education became teachers. Um, people who had some medical knowledge or training became pharmacists and trainees and uh, people who had physician degrees already were physicians. And of course, they had their own little hospitals and they taught each other a lot. And so it was quite interesting for me to learn that while he was interned, how much education actually had gone on. No matter where education comes from, it's a gift. And I think the fact that he could utilize that time and it didn't feel like he wasn't achieving a goal probably was a great thing as far as he was concerned. You know, honestly, they didn't talk about camp. And prior to camp, they, didn't, they really didn't talk. Uh, from, basically from camp and before, they didn't talk about it. They made a concerted effort not to. She said she had a lot of fun there. Because it, you know, she was always with her friends. They always got together and played. It, it was just one big play date to her, I think. All my mother uh, told me about that time, what I remember is that it was just awful because they were housed in a lot of the horse stables. And that was a temporary setup while they were building the camps across the country, and then as soon as those camps were uh, finished with construction, then um, my family was um, boarded up into trains. In terms of uh, life in the camps, uh, for both my mother and father, um, and you have to remember that they were 17, 18 years of age at this point in time, and so their life behind barbed wire and I just remember them saying, at least in my mother's case, it was fun. And I would look at her and say, what do you mean? How could it be fun when your, you know, your uh, basic citizenship has been stripped from you, <laughs> you know, to, to be behind barbed wire? And she said, well, you have to remember, we made, uh, we, we were kids and um, we were all together because it was like one big block party. And we were making oleo and camouflage netting uh, for the war effort. Once they were in the camps, um, it was all communal dining um, and, and they set up their own uh, organizations. So they set up their own baseball teams, they set up their own schools. Uh, Caucasian teachers would come in to teach. Um, and, and so they had their own community. So it was, if, if you could say anything about the Nisei, they're very resourceful in that they lived within their means beyond that beyond that facade of, oh yeah, it's fun, is like, we come out of the camps, we're still hated probably, what are we gonna do? I remember uh, driving through the San Joaquin Valley with my parents, and I was, this was probably in the early 50s, and we'd stop at a service station, and uh, they were all uh, service, whether you actually got service at that time, and uh, no one would come out and put gas in my parents' car. So we'd have to try to find another service station. They went for a, to the barber shop for a haircut, and they said, oh, sorry, we can't give you a haircut because you're Japanese. I remember going to restaurants, uh, not being served, so we, as a family, get up and jump in our car and try to find another restaurant to, uh, to have lunch or dinner at. I know that she was bitter simply because of the experience. Number one, her college education was interrupted, plus, uh, 
she went through the experience of having to basically see her parents uh, sell everything at a huge discount before they were uh, uh, taken off to camp. I remember my father and my mother telling me of other neighbors and friends of theirs who lost everything. Uh, they turned over their farm or their business to what they considered good friends. When they came back, uh, the farm or the business was changed uh, into someone else's name and they never got it back. Many non-Japanese friends and neighbors supported the internees through numerous small acts of kindness, such as sending them food and basic supplies, looking after their property, writing them encouraging letters, and carrying out various tasks they didn't have time to attend to before their incarceration. This is my mom's bicycle. When she was uh, interned, they took the bike. She couldn't take the bike with her to camp because it was too big. It was only what you could carry in your arms and your back. So her father gave this to a neighbor and said, we don't know if we're coming back. Take care of your Shino's bike. When this gentleman who he gave the bike to was on his deathbed, he told his siblings that you need to return this bike to Yoshino. Well, her name was Yoshino Uemura, and now she got married, and her name was now Elaine Odomo. And they couldn't find her, so finally through the internet, they found Uemura, they found my uncle, and they found mom. And they did this huge story on the cycle of promise. Um, Alice Kazarian was the person who gave her the bike back. In speaking to many Nisei about their internment experiences, I came to realize what a profound psychological impact internment had on them and why so many of them have been very reticent to talk about it, even to their kids. The war changed their lives tremendously because it meant they were, they had left California, uh, they had gone to the Midwest, they had seen a different lifestyle. They were very surprised with the South. They had never seen that kind of discrimination before. And so, even though in their own lives they had seen discrimination, they had never seen the black-white conflict before. And so that was a very shocking, real thing that came to mind, that they all had first-hand looks at. When I first came back to California, uh, although I wanted to go back to Cal Poly and, 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 and finish my course, trying to make a living was a full-time job. Because I had, uh, uh, gone to college before, uh, it gave me enough, uh, I think, uh, uh, confidence, I guess is the word, look for a nursery that I could start, and, I, and, and that luckily I found one in, in Beverly Hill, which with the help of my dad, uh, I opened a nursery there. And uh, again, I, I guess uh, I can turn to uh, the education I got, because uh, by then, uh, I, I knew all of the plant by name, Latin names and everything. We uh, got discharged. And I came home to San Jose. Found out that they didn't want to rent to Japanese. I, said, you know, I was still in the uniform. Then I had to get a job. I went to the laboratory because I knew the laboratory well. And says, no. I used to see about 200 patients a day drawing blood and getting everything ready for them. He says, yeah, but that was the military. This is civilian life. It's different. They made a really concerted effort after the war to not speak Japanese anymore, to, to I guess, Americanize themselves more. Our pronunciation of Japanese words was just horrible. <laughs> And a lot of my friends, you know, they were going to Japanese school to learn, you know, more Japanese, and my, my parents didn't want us to. I don't think there was ever any notion of my folks going back to college after the war, since they had lost everything during the war, both sides had lost everything, um, they had to go to work uh, immediately. It is certainly understandable that many Nisei would not want to share such pain with their children to want to protect them, to shield them from such painful experiences so they could grow up seeing the promise and hope of America rather than its injustices and cruelties. I think at the critical juncture in their life, which I think is a, is a college experience and trying to, to, to map out what you want to do in life, when that's totally disrupted, uh, I, th I think it, it's, it's life altering. I mean, I think she would have continued with her dental hygiene. 
edu uh, striving for that degree. Um, she probably would have worked for for her father. If things stayed as as is, I probably would would have gone back to the farm or something, and uh, maybe uh, we were we were Nisei's and. Uh, I don't know, the opportunities were not there at that time, but which was changed by the war. I know that they would have pursued education, they would have probably, my Aunt Helen probably would have received her degree and um, even though she ended her career with a high position as an, as an adjudicator, um, who knows what she might have become if she had been allowed to finish college and receive a degree. Uh, in business as she wanted because she was a very um, organized person and she worked in the administrative part uh, of the Veterans Administration and I know she received a, a lot of promotions one after the other and that was all without her degree. I can think of no better way to begin the commencement season than to be here today honoring former San Diego State University students who overcame injustice intolerance and ignorance and succeeded in spite of everything that happened to them through no fault of their own. This is a momentous day for the California State University. It is a momentous day because San Diego State is the first of six CSU campuses to hold commencement ceremonies that award honorary Bachelor of Humane Letters degrees to our former Japanese American students and their families. The reason nobody, nobody knows too much about it because I think, like the East say, they says, uh, it, shikata ga nai, which meant it can't be helped. And they took it in, uh, on the chin and kept moving forward. Well, I, I don't think it's right that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we had to move out. Uh, I think it was uh, more of a injustice uh, and that, but that we were asked to do this, so uh, we, 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 we have to go forward so that our, the gen our generation and the, the generation following it will have a better life in America. When you don't learn all of it, you don't have any bitterness. There's, it's so different, and yet it's only a generation away. I, I find that amazing, but um, there's absolutely no bitterness, which I think is really pretty amazing because I think most of us who've grown up now would probably be pretty angry and pretty bitter. The awarding of these honorary degrees will hopefully help make up to a small degree for the involuntary disruption of their education and bring closer to this most unfortunate chapter in their lives. But I also believe the awarding of these honorary degrees is important for the symbolic significance of the message it sends to all Americans. It tells us that part of America's greatness is because it can own up to and make amends for its mistakes. Perhaps more importantly, it also tells us that we cannot take our democracy for granted, but that all Americans have responsibility and have a responsibility and stake in preserving our freedoms and liberties for all groups in our society, regardless of race, religion, or nationality. For me, going to college is not just a possibility. It is an expectation. I know, however, that 70 years ago, the opportunity to go to college was taken away from the Nisei. They had done nothing wrong, except for being born Japanese in America. Because of the Nisei's courage, loyalty, and hard work, Japanese Ameri Americans are recognized today as loyal Americans. Because of their sacrifices, I will be able to go to college. We must commit ourselves to never again letting liberty and justice be taken away from any American just because the color of their skin is different. Okage sama de, because of you, I am. Thank you for what you have done for Japanese Americans, for all Americans, and for me. You are like a handprint on my heart. I will not forget what the Nisei have done. Congratulations on receiving your diploma. Today's will be the first presentation. 
organized by a CSU campus since the trustees approved the program less than three months ago. Chancellor Charles Reed said it best when we began this project. In Tournament of Japanese American Citizens, he said, represents the worst of a nation driven by fear and prejudice. By issuing honorary degrees, we hope to achieve a small right in the face of such grave wrongs. Now, nearly 80 Fresno State students had to leave school. Mr. Otomo was one of them. Today, we recognize his determination and courage and the courage of people like Mr. Otomo who overcame their challenges to lead exemplary, inspiring lives. You know, I didn't realize that this was such a special event to my dad. This was, um, and he didn't realize it until after he looked around the room and, and said, you know what, I, I still can make a difference. My dad was told by his cardiologist that he would not make it through the holidays. It was, again, we talk about a, a breath of life. It, it added a good six months to his life. And he was able to open up and, and do things that he never would have done before. So I'm happy. Yeah. No, it was incredible, not only for him and our family, uh, but also I think it was the first step. Was, he was the first one to get this degree. Um, yes, big step right. for the Japanese community mm -hmm. uh, everywhere in California and the entire CSU system. Um, I thought it was really cool that I'm the only person I know that got to see my grandfather get his degree. I thought about it many days after my daughter pushed me into it. I said, ah, baloney, like, I don't want it. But one of my daughters says, I oh, should get it because they're going to give it to you. The more I thought about it, my five daughters received a degree, my wife, my son-in-law all got the degree. I'm the only one, one, no degree. I said, hey, I better get my degree. One of the ones I talked to was, uh, his son came out, got the degree, and, and he said, his old man would have been real proud to have this. And I'm prouder than he is to receive his degree. And that's the way I feel, that uh, I'm one of the family now that I got this degree. First, that I uh, will be awarding the degree to uh, Atsumi Areta Fukuchi, who was born in Hawaii, and her San Francisco State studies focused on education and the social sciences. And this evening, she is accompanied by her son and daughter and their spouses. <coughs> I thought it was wonderful that it had happened after, what, 60 years or so, you know? And I thought it would never happen, but it happened, and I felt really comfortable and happy. My, my brother Greg and I uh, uh, accepted it for, for, for my mother. And I think, if anything, it's, it's probably one of the proudest moments in, in my brother Greg's life and in my life because I know how much my mom uh, cherished education. I think if she was there when she was in the cap and gown, I think she would have taken off her uh, mortar cap and threw it up in the air and was, would probably be jumping up and down with joy. Carl Yoshimine, when you were forced to leave San Diego State in 1942, you had just discovered your love of history. We are grateful that in spite of this injustice, you persevered and eventually obtained a bachelor's degree in history from Ashbury College, a master's degree in religious education from Ashbury Theological Seminary, and another degree from a divinity school in Berkeley. No doubt your life experience, together with the spirituality that has guided you, has inspired many others to be true to themselves and never lose faith despite the, hard, the hardships they may encounter. It is a lesson this year's class of graduates would be wise to learn as they enter this next phase of their lives. Reverend Yoshimine, would you please join me to accept your diploma? I 
think one thing that I learned in, in my experience through camp is uh, we can't afford to stay in one place in our lives. Uh, if you're hurt, to heal and to move on. Uh, it, it's not worth, um, you know, holding the torch and, and always being angry because they'll just ruin your own life and, and the people around you. And I think that's what education does. It's not just learning things, but it's actually putting it into actual situations where you can move ahead. And I think that's one thing that the, the receiving the, the degree reveals that uh, you, the, the school acknowledges uh, where we have been and wants to help us move on. I, I know, you know, the, the song, you know, fight on, fight on, the yes, Aztec man, sons of Montezuma, we were swinging again. So I, I remember that so on, to my dying day. <laughs> Daughter Barbara Mukai, grandson Kyle Mukai, and sister Sophia Takeda are here to accept an honorary degree posthumously on behalf of, of Viola Midori Takeda. Uh, Viola Midori Takeda's time at San Diego State was cut short when she was assigned to the Poston Relocation Center in Arizona. She left the camp for Chicago, where she, where she met her beloved husband, George Kita, Kitahara. They returned to California after the war and began their new life together. Her family tells us that Viola was a devoted wife and a caring mother of four. She passed away just last month, on April 10th. We're saddened that we were not able to offer this symbol of our gratitude to her in person. I think she would have been really excited and then very proud. Uh, I'm sure it would have meant a lot to her. She went to San Diego, San Diego State for a reason. And I'm sure she would have liked to have possibly a dream to, to finish her dream there. I don't think being in a relocation camp was a dream for her, really. <laughs> she had passed away a month before. It really was a bittersweet and emotional moment for me. Um, actually, much more so than her funeral. <laughs> you know, when I think about the degree, I just thought it was just wonderful to see that document in hand. It was a fantastic feeling because I knew how much it meant to my dad to go to school and how tough it was to give it up. Um, the interruption was hard. My dad probably would be quite proud, if he were still alive today, he would be quite proud of the fact that he got the degree from Cal State Fresno. Well, I, I was uh, very honored that uh, the university uh, or the Board of Trustees had recognized uh, that so many of us went to the university at that time trying, trying to be, become better citizens and better educated, and uh, I, th I think uh, from the education standpoint, it was really that uh, that the uh, trustees, the universities, have recognized the achievements of the uh, Japanese Americans as a whole. They knew it was a mistake that the government had made. They knew that uh, amends were in the works of being done. And then when, when it did happen, that the reparations were, uh, were given out and uh, the government did acknowledge that it was a mistake, then I think they felt um, that that was good, that they lived to see that. And so when this event happened at Fresno State, it just brought tears to my eyes when I accepted their honorary degrees because I just wished so much that they could have seen that all of this was acknowledged, that the government and the communities really understood what actually happened and um, that um, honorary degrees were given. They would have just been completely blown away. They would have just, they would have had such a good time being there and, and uh, because, you know, their lives did turn out really well 
And so I think they would have just been tickled to pieces to just get this degree on their own. For my mother, as I said, it's too bad she didn't know about it and, uh, and I couldn't tell her, you know, that this, this thing is coming. Uh, but for my father, um, it was fabulous. I mean, uh, uh, you know, that um, uh, he could get this and, and he proudly talks about it and uh, from a spirit side, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, it's really been a great thing. Um, at, at least one way to um, uh, seal the wound. Somehow in, during life, I guess I was looking for something or I guess you could drive me for something, not knowing what it was. But um, uh, I think when I received this uh, news, I, I felt that uh, that uh, I accomplished something in my life that I've been looking for. I believe we must remind ourselves of the immortal words of Pastor Martin Niemöller, who in recounting his experiences in Nazi Germany wrote, and I quote, in Germany they came for the communists. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics. I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, there was no one left to speak up for me. I think that's the point. It, it's not just a history lesson. It's uh, not nostalgia. It's not uh, going back. What it is is really going forward. It's a teaching moment to talk about the importance of the Constitution, the importance of people's rights. And no matter the environment, no matter the ethnicity, no matter the gender, the gender preference, whatever, people have these rights at all times as Americans. And you can't take them lightly. You can't, just because the situation may be uh, very negative around a war experience or, or terrorism or whatever the case may be, you can't use that as a reason to trample people's constitutional rights. And as an individual, you have a right of due process. And as an American, you have the protections of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And those things were violated in this chapter of history. And oftentimes we go up to the edge. Sometimes individuals step over and they violate these rights and we have to pull people back. And I think it also showed the resiliency of the government in their ability to finally redress and apologize for the experience and correct, make corrections in our democracy. In concluding, let me just say to our Nisei honorees that in accepting these honorary degrees, you are speaking up not only for Japanese Americans, but for all Americans. Your experiences should be both a warning and an inspiration to all Americans. It warns us that the U.S. Constitution alone will not protect our liberties and freedoms, that it's just a piece of paper which is given life only by the efforts and vigilance of all of us to maintain our democratic principles and ideals for all of our citizens. And it inspires us because after the internment, you did not allow yourself to be consumed in bitterness, but through hard work and determination, you rebuilt your lives and helped ensure a brighter future for upcoming generations of Japanese Americans. So on behalf of all Japanese Americans, and dare I say for all Americans, I want to express our gratitude to the honorees and the entire Nisei generation for their fortitude, resilience, and sacrifice that has left us with such an enduring and important legacy. I humbly accept the honorary degree and thanks all the dignitaries for being here. Hey, this is something. <laughs> you know, they say old men don't cry, but I had some tears. You know, thank everybody for being here and through all this adversity 
I think the USA is the best country in the world. God bless you and thank you. You've heard the never before told stories that are part of the history of the California State University and the country. We all must make sure that actions like this never happen to any group of people anywhere again. <laughs>